My father's father was a nuclear physicist and a wonderful man. A grand storyteller that I could never, ever compete with. With his deep, rumbling voice, he could recite Beowulf from memory and tell you the secrets of the atom. A military man with a romantic heart, he once told us children about a time when men were men, and no one questioned that. In the late 1950s, he was assigned to an anti-aircraft missile battery protecting an air force base on the east coast. He had purchased himself a used blue convertible to cruise in and have fun with his friends. The Cold War had produced a need for men at the ready, poised with their fingers ready to push a button at any sign of attack. I'm sure with his short haircut and sunglasses and starched clothes he must have appeared, like respect, come alive. On the day he saw my grandmother for the first time, she was alone on a friend's porch, back in a day when people hadn't separated themselves with the monotony of the internet. He stopped and spoke to her directly. Was his friend home? She said no. Did she want to go for a ride? No. It sufficed for the moment, and he drove on. But the peculiarity of this lonely, beautiful woman on a porch had piqued his interest. Why didn't she want to go with him? He was determined to find out more about her. He came by again days later and asked if his friend was home. No. Did she want to go for a ride? I suspect that back then this type of situation wasn't so worrisome or dangerous as it is now. Maybe it was charm. Maybe it was his smile. Maybe it was love at second sight? Who knows? She said yes, but with one stipulation. That she could bring her little boy along. That little boy was my father. They built a life together, and he adopted my father as his own. To me... Thinking back on this, it's so familiar. I know my story differs from his, but I think back on all the influences I've had in my life and wondered, have the moments I've lived been lived before? Is it always such a bad thing to repeat the past? Spending this much on an anniversary dinner is common in a bloodless marriage. Two people staring at each other over a plate of bloody filet mignon, sharply dressed arugula salad, and of course, two glasses of red Merlot that scream to be recognized by more sensitive palates. We are by no means connoisseurs. Just a couple locked in perpetual averageness, while the table laments more classy elbows. What more can we eke out of this relationship? What God has put together? After downing my glass, I say... That actress I met in Boston was pretty cool. She replies, I don't really care. And she means it. Without blinking or looking away, she's cutting her steak so hard it scrapes the plate like fingernails on a chalkboard. I ask, did you like the roses? She says, they were mostly dead when I got there. I think they froze them in shipping. She smiles over a mouthful of neat meat. I'm thinking, not thank you. Not, oh, I read the card and I love it. Just dead flowers. Did you like the card? Didn't you say that to me six years ago? You had to have seen someone more beautiful than me by now. I shake my head, no. The waitress comes and fills my glass again. Could you leave the bottle, please? Okay, she says. How are the kids today? Well... Your daughter puked up all over the couch, so I had to clean that up, and your son got sent home from school for calling a little girl a twat, so my day was fine. Why are they always mine when they do something wrong? Because they are. I can hear the salad crunching between her teeth. You gonna drink that whole bottle, babe? Probably. I might have a few beers, too. There might be no reason to try anymore. I keep thinking, just hold on. God gave you a gift today. When you met her there, it meant something. It was a sign. And you know it. She's a gift. Your kids are a gift. I wonder what Superman's doing. No, never mind him. She looks me over up and down with squinted eyes. Who are you trying to impress? What? I ask. And by the way, guys... A question answered with a question is usually a sign of deception that girls can detect immediately. With all the workouts, your chest is bigger, you're thinner, 
Who are you trying to impress? No one. Most lines I gave her were the truth because she never asked the right questions. I have to wonder, had she asked me then, are you still gay? Would I have answered truthfully? This line was a half-truth. No one, I swear. It's alright. Whoever she is, I'll find out. I thought, downing my third or fourth glass of the night, at least you're wrong about one thing, my beautiful wife. She carried on. I carried on. The night moved on to the general, lazy, yet loquacious talk of everyday married life. Three drinks turn into four. Times of appointments. Blah. Five drinks, maybe six. Schedules for payments. Yada yada. With the kids laid down and the lights out, I dream of a life with someone else. It didn't take long for my life to take a nosedive into shady depression. I started fighting with my wife regularly about everything and nothing. Not normal spousal tiffs, the kind that forced me to take a lonely place on a friend's couch for the night. I fought with random strangers for no reason, always with an intense desire to fuck someone up. I got angry with my kids for, well, being kids. My family didn't understand me anymore. I had quit my job over a small pay argument. Everything was collapsing around me. I had begun to live in a constant cycle of obsession that couldn't be broken but by responsibility alone. Not wanting to accept the reality of how life had turned out, I dreamed of hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, nuclear warfare, and even suicide. Anything that would decimate this quaint little life. But how did I get here? Without any effort, I had become that man. That man who smashed a window in my face and told me he was going to cut my throat. And now, I have no idea who I am. Fourth anniversary. Eight years I've known nothing but you. I can never unknow you. We've been through a lot together and every moment of it has been important. You've been my friend, my confidant, and my love. You gave me two children whom I failed to father. You spared me so much judgment and pain. I rotate my wedding ring around my finger as most men do, playing with it, the eternal band. Can this go on forever? She and I are sitting in our car after a tour of the mansions of Newport. The opulence was overwhelming. What I wouldn't have given to have built a life like that for us. I thumb the band. It's part of my skin now. Without this, I am only. Without you, I'm no one. After all these years, I still don't know what you wanted. Do you still love me? She asks. Yes, I do. It's the truth, but not so meaningful as it used to be. But it's at that moment that I say the words that all men say at the end of a relationship. I love you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. I have to wonder, are the thoughts of every man different when they're saying this? This pile of bullshit? This excuse? What does it even mean? I love you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a way of saying, I can't do this. It's too painful to continue. She buries her face in her hands and begins to cry. I can feel her pain. I can. But I don't know what to do with it. I tell her I'm sorry. That I know it's unfair. But it's not me who suggests that we should separate. It's actually her that says it. I can't believe it. And out. An easy out. I move out of the apartment, and I begin what I consider sort of phase three of my life, where everything's changed, and I'm alone with nothing but my thoughts. Later, I find out that she's dating someone else, and I'm not phased by that at all. I don't even think I care, and the thing is, I meet him, 
and the guy's so nice. I could totally understand why this happened. He's everything I'm not. In between on the phone, she makes these little jibs and jabs about us getting back together. There's been a time for us to sort of simmer down and reflect. She asks, why can't we get back together? Why can't it work anymore? I say, because you're dating someone else. She says, yeah, but I'd drop him if I knew that you would come back to me and that things would be okay. I tell her I can't do that. Why? Because I'm gay, Dana. You know that. You've always known that. 